Hello and welcome to another World War II podcast. I'm Angus Wallace. In this episode, we're looking at three brothers all in the US Navy at the start of the war and their remarkable story. But before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to thank all those people who support the show. I couldn't do this without your help. If you enjoy the podcast every couple of weeks, why not tip me a dollar? This not only helps me cover my costs, but it also helps me find the time to put the show together. Run the website, the Facebook page, organise the graphics, do the interviews and so on. To see how you can become a patron of the show, please take a moment to go to patreon.com slash ww2podcast or click on donate on the website. If you enjoy this episode, supporters of the show will have access to Sally and I talking for nearly another 30 minutes in and around the topic. So that's patreon.com slash ww2podcast or click on donate on the website. So today I'm joined by Sally Mott Freeman. Her book the Jersey Brothers, a missing naval officer in the Pacific and his family's quest to bring him home, follows her father and his two brothers through the war. Bill Mott would start the war in FDR's White House map room. His brother Benny would be on the carrier, the USS Enterprise, and Barton was a supply officer based in the Philippines. Their experience brings out how difficult it must have been for families at war. Sally, thank, thanks for joining me. Um, to start with, I wonder if you could uh, introduce the three brothers. Well, the three brothers are in chronological order. Benny is the eldest. Bill, my father, is the middle brother. And Barton was their younger brother, uh, seven years younger than Bill. He was the first born in uh, their mother's second marriage. Her first marriage ended in divorce, very unusually, sort of in that era. Bill and Benny, I think, found a role for themselves in this new family structure by sort of being Barton's protectors. He was born prematurely. He was undersized, and they were always, you know, helping him, teaching him sports, kind of, you know, protecting him from the bullies and so forth. And Bill and Benny both graduated from the Naval Academy and basically launched careers. They were very independent. Helen, their mother, really wanted this same coveted course for her youngest uh, but he struggled. He was not, he sort of didn't have a military bearing. He really wasn't a military type individual. He was sort of sensitive and literary, if you will, but she wanted it. And so he did go to the Naval Academy, but bilged, as they used to say, after two years for failure of, of to, to pass a must pass mathematics exam. I think he failed it by seven one hundredths of one percent. Uh, and so he went on to the University of North Carolina and finished with a degree in business. But by that time, it was late 1940, and the mandatory draft had been passed into law. And Helen did not want Barton sent to the front. I mean, this was sort of a – this was the typical cycle where she she feared for her youngest son, and Bill and Benny stepped in, especially Bill, because by that time he was a well-placed naval intelligence officer in – Washington to obtain a, um, a commission for Barton in the supply corps. But the Navy had other plans, and Barton was sent to the Philippines literally weeks before the sneak Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, which was quickly followed by a sneak attack on the Philippines, and he was wounded, got shrapnel wounds during that attack, aerial attack on Cavite Naval Base, and he was in the base hospital when all the ships were ordered out, MacArthur's bombers had already been destroyed on the ground, wingtip to wingtip. And so the, the fleet had no air protection, especially for the, its stable of submarines traveling through some of the clearest waters in the world. And so he was left behind. The, uh, the Navy patients that were wounded in the attack on Cavite were um, transferred to Sternberg Hospital in Manila. On New Year's Eve, MacArthur ordered all the Army patients at that hospital out and onto a Red Cross ship because it was really just hours before the capital city fell to the Japanese. Everyone else had been ordered to Bataan or Corregidor. And these Navy patients and a skeletal uh, Navy medical staff were captured right from the hospital. They were basically the first captives, prisoners of war in the Philippines after Manila fell to the Japanese. Bataan and Corregidor held out respectively for another four or five months. Mm. So he's, he's very he's very unfortunate, really. 
Uh, do, do you know? Did you have? Did you ever? Did you ever find out what happened to the uh, the army guys that were uh, evacuated? Did they manage to get off, or did they just manage to get to? Yes, they were placed on a um, a, a converted inter island steamer. They painted a red cross on the funnel, and they were the last ship to leave Manila before it fell to the Japanese. It was the last ship, and they just hacked the lines and took off, and they made it to Australia. This was the confusion you see because from naval intelligence in Washington, as my father was trying to, Bill that is, my father was trying to locate Barton. The captain of his ship was in uh, Darwin. This ship, I believe, went to, might have gone to Darwin, Darwin or Melbourne. And there was radio silence. There were There was no communication from the parts of the Philippines, Manila in particular, back to um where they were collecting intelligence. They didn't have radio communication, anything. So he didn't find out what had happened to Barton or that he was even still alive until well into 1942. Well, let's get to your your father, Bill, (laughs) because he he really has the most incredible job, um, incredible job at the White House. I mean, it must be one of the, uh, I was going to say, peachiest of assignments but i don't mean it like that i mean from a historical historical point of view i mean you are at the seat tell us about what your your father's job was bill's job was at the white house well first how he got there when when he went to graduate from the naval academy in the teeth of the great depression um he did not pass the final eye exam which was a requisite um it was an absolute requirement for being commissioned as an ensign upon graduation and so he went into the reserves eventually and got a law degree and was working in washington and in 1940 He stayed very involved with the Navy and the Naval Academy Association. Because of that, he became acquainted with the head of uh, naval intelligence in Washington. And this Admiral Anderson said, we need you. You know, there's going to be a war. We need you down at the department. And my father, who was in patent law at that point, re-entered the Navy some seven years after he graduated from the Naval Academy. He did very well at Naval Intelligence, and after Pearl Harbor, um, of course, Winston Churchill came to visit. You know, his desire, he, he knew that America would be enraged by the attack on Pearl Harbor, and he made a personal visit to ensure that the fight against the Nazis was the priority for the United States. And when he came, he stayed on the second floor of the White House and set up a traveling map room in the room across the hall from him. I believe it was the Queen's bedroom, actually. Roosevelt was so impressed by this map room, he said to his naval aide, you know, you need to set me up a room like Churchill's. Robert Montgomery, who had worked for the Naval Attaché in London, was very familiar with the war and map room beneath Westminster. And so he uh, got it going. He went over to the National Geographic and got the charts and sort of Uh, laid out the room much as it is laid out in London, but he wanted to join the hunt for U-boats. And so they started a search at Naval Intelligence for someone to take to run it permanently. And that was when my father was tapped to go over and finish what Robert Montgomery had started. It started initially as um, sort of covering the naval theaters of war, but eventually it encompassed the global war scene. It was, of course, metastasizing across the globe. And so they had the European front, the supply lines, moving access and allied armies, getting updates 24 hours a day. The room was padlocked and guarded 24 hours a day. My father had 12 watch officers, six each Navy and Army, and they respectively updated the two theaters. Roosevelt was there at least twice a day um, to get briefings on the war situation, and he held several meetings there. In addition to that, it was the repository for all of Roosevelt's secret diplomatic cables with other allied leaders. All of his interactions with uh, Churchill, whose code name was the former naval person, because he, of course, had been the Lord of the Admiralty, uh, and they all had code names, but Winston Churchill and Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek, uh, Joseph Stalin, and sort of the maybe the less prominent other allied leaders. I mean, this did not go in and out of the State Department. It went in and out of the map room, these 
communications. So it was the epicenter of Allied war making. I mean, he really is at the epicenter of everything. I mean, how much information could he, was ever filtered back from the Philippines uh, about the prisoners of war uh, that had been picked up? I mean, because everything must have passed through there, or, or he must have been able to, you know, tweak things to flow through him. Well, initially there was very little, and only when these. Uh, unsurrendered American and Filipino guerrillas started organizing and tinkering to life these shortwave radios and call, you know, calling out. They they eventually reached um, stations in San Francisco and said, you know, we are here, we are we are resisting. Can you hear us? Can you help us? And once they determined that these shortwave calls for help were not you know, Japanese faints. They started organizing and uh, to try to help them. And one uh, American naval officer had escaped under the guise uh, of a Panamanian consul, made his way to Washington and said, I know where these guerrillas are. He was American, but he had a stevedoring company in Manila. He was married to a Filipino woman. He was a very established, well-established Filipino citizen, even though he was held an American passport. They snuck him back in, and that is how they began to arm these this resistance movement to pave the way for the eventual retaking of the islands. I mean, that's an, it's another incredible story that, uh, you know, that's a book in, all, all in its own right. But there's still... It takes them a long time to get any any. Uh, you, well, I was gonna, let, let's flip this round. Barton doesn't rec- in prison doesn't receive any mail, and the family don't get anything going in the off- opposite direction from him. So it's quite a long time before the, anybody realizes that he's he's actually alive. Yes, that's correct. It wasn't until there was an escape, and and the naval officers who had escaped and had been quartered with him reported and said he's doing fine. He was fine when I last saw him. He's done great credit to himself and so forth. That was the first concrete news. And in fact, let me just quickly go back to your question. You said what was Bill getting in the map room in terms of intelligence about Barton? Well, it was it was a trickle initially. Uh, because, first of all, MacArthur was by that time in Australia, and he was also getting these shortwave messages from the unsurrendered Filipino guerrillas, and he wasn't so quick to forward them to Washington. He didn't want Washington to basically force his hand with what to do with the guerrillas and so forth, and he set up an independent intelligence network. And so that was one of the frustrations of learning about what was going on in the Philippines and organizing from, uh, you know, sort of from the top of the bureaucracy down, what, how to handle it, what to do, how to best support them, because MacArthur didn't want that. He wanted to have an independent operation. He used the Australian Intelligence Service, the AIB, uh, I believe is the acronym, only when his hand was forced were these communications forwarded to Washington. And, and, and meanwhile, you know, Barton's taken to uh, Cab- uh Sorry, is it Cabana? Cabana <laughs> I've been trying to. Pra- I've been practicing it for an hour, and I, I, can, I still can't get it to trip off the tongue. <laughs> Cabana Twan, yes. Uh, and, and the conditions are, are there are everything that everyone could always imagine of of Japanese prisoners of war camps are horrendous, aren't they, for them? Horrendous. Full, full of uh, disease, very little food, hot, e- either either flooded from the monsoons or so dry, you you know the the your lips stick to your teeth, if you will. Very little water. Uh, deaths were were hundreds a day. Uh, there was no sanitation, and it, actually the Americans gradually built um, sanitation facilities to, to try to reduce the death by disease, it went from basically intolerable to somewhat insufferable, but they made improvements. And he's transferred to uh, a penal colony, which, to be honest, didn't sound vastly better, but it is 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 a better place for them to be at. Is that right in saying? Yes. It also had uh, one of the things they were doing at this penal colony was was farming. And so they were able to purloin supplements f- from what, you know, the rice bowl twice a day. They were able to get, you know, bits of coffee, fruit, 
husks of rice, you know, lizards, which they would kill and cook. They were able to supplement their diets to at least a, so they could at least sustain themselves, which, and these opportunities did not avail themselves at Cabanatuan. Yeah, and, and even sustaining themselves is doesn't, you know, doesn't really get across the horror, really, does it? Right, right. <laughs> They were just as cruel. Uh, I think the climate was a little bit better, although it was also hot. And I think psychologically, they felt that they had made progress by going to Deveo. It was closer to Australia. It was larger. It was. Uh, it seemed better equipped because it was already built as a prison. It was actually a prison camp. A penal. The penal colony was a prison for cutthroats, basically, for murderers, for some of the worst incorrigibles in the Philippines. And and actually, the war prisoners made friends with um, these the so-called cutthroats. They had a common enemy. You know, your enemy's enemy is your friend, uh, as they say, and uh, neither one of them liked the Japanese. And in fact, these two of these prisoners who uh, had received life sentences for murder helped facilitate the escape of, of 10 war prisoners, American war prisoners. And, and so they, you know, they turn, it turned out to be a very productive and fortuitous um, relationship. Well, this is one of those things where, you know, obviously Bill's well placed. So they, 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 these prisoners escape and the guerrillas amazingly get them off the island and they amazingly get themselves back to um, the U.S. So, so Bill's aware of this information. He can presumably have access to what they're reporting back. Absolutely. And he met with a few of them and you know they were they eventually were recovering. I mean they, they had malaria, they had some of them had worse diseases than that. They were terribly undernourished and they were sent to Washington for debriefings, but they also had to do long stints at Walter Reed Medical Center um, as they recovered. And my father visited them at Walter Reed. And uh, there were two Navy. One was in the Marines. The other was Navy. Actually had graduated from the Naval Academy only a few years before my father did and got this direct report about what had happened to Barton, where he was quartered, um, how he was doing and where he might be, you know, if there was going to be a mass rescue attempt, exactly, you know, they, he had him triangulated finally, belatedly. This was in, by this time it was 1943. What I hadn't realized was that uh, after this, this attempt and the, you know, the, 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 uh, it, people, those in power become aware of, of the treatment of the prisoners um, there's a, the press is kind of gagged to, to not report it, which must have put Bill in a in a very difficult position with his family on what he could and couldn't tell them. And uh, of course, there's a chapter in the book where before he goes to see himself, uh, and he knows that the gagging of these escaped prisoners was basically the censoring of them was going to come to an end. They'd been especially this one, this William Dias, who was a well-known uh, war hero, uh, wanted to tell the story. He had already uh, told it to a Chicago newspaper, and they and it was embargoed and embargoed and continued to be embargoed. But the more uh, the story was beginning to leak out, this uh, Baton Relief Organization had got a hold of it. Of course, politics played a role because the Chicago paper was a conservative newspaper, and they felt that it needed to be aired and it was sort of it supported MacArthur in a way they they definitely supported MacArthur in their political views and in their coverage of the war but the pressure to release the story increased like an untapped fire hose what was the thinking behind the gagging of it why why were they trying to keep it quiet on two levels i mean the given reason was if if this story gets out uh, the Gripsham, which was the goodwill vessel, won't get there with the Red Cross boxes, um, that the Japanese will treat the prisoners worse, not better. But the real reason at the highest echelon was that they were afraid, just as immediately following Pearl Harbor, uh, they were afraid that it would so enrage the American public that it would derail the cross-channel invasion plan and the uh, Europe first priority. That was the thinking, that they needed to put it off as long as they possibly could. 
but it ended up it didn't derail it it was it was leaking out anyway the army and navy gave a joint statement on what had taken place and after that in january 1944 the story was finally released and it went around the world in a matter of 48 hours i mean the world learned and in fact it did galvanize the american public and it it did strengthen resources that were being sent to the pacific theater which were basically 50% of the resources being sent to the pacific up until that point they were half of what were being sent to europe both in terms of personnel and sort of financial support and so forth with the release of that story it improved and i think accelerated you know, our our race across the Pacific and sort of the conclusion of that war. Of course, they didn't know at the time that how it how that war would end. But uh, the uh, the thinking was they were better supplied from that point forward. Yeah, I could only ever see it as a as a as a galvanizing uh, uh, effect, really. But it's it's not just uh, Barton who, who who's in the Pacific. There's um, Benny's out there as well. So the three brothers, Benny's out there, and he's he's again at the at the sharp end of, of the war on the uh, USS Enterprise. It's an amazing story. Now the um, USS Enterprise had left Pearl Harbor on November twenty eighth, nineteen forty one, to ferry, if you will, Marine bombers to Wake Island, which at that point was undefended, and they were beginning to realize their vulnerability at uh, these small atolls out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And so they escorted the bombers. There was a small convoy. They were traveling under radio silence. Uh, and once the bombers took off and landed on Wake, they swung around and they headed back to Pearl. And they were supposed to arrive on December 6, 1941. But there was a tremendous squall, at which converged with trade winds, and Admiral Halsey reluctantly slowed the pace and delayed the arrival at Pearl Harbor until the morning of December 7th. As they approached Pearl Harbor, maybe they were 100 miles off or so, their planes took off. They sent their own carrier planes ahead to sort of prepare for the berthing of the ship and so forth. And those planes tangled with the Japanese planes that were taking off from their own carrier decks on their way to attack um, the Anchorage. The USS Enterprise was one of the few ships that was spared the attack because they were still safely out at sea. And they returned to Pearl Harbor on December 8th, the night of the 8th, because they were immediately dispatched to search for um, the Japanese fleet, Kido Butai. And they returned to, you know, a devastated harbor. The waters were loaded with wreckage and bodies and um, still slick with flaming oil and so forth. And then they refueled and resupplied and immediately swung around and prevailed in one after another of some of the most lopsided naval clashes in American history, and they they won again and again and again. It's the most decorated carrier in American history. You know, they lost a lot of personnel. They were hit many times, and, of course, the Japanese kept claiming that they had sunk the USS Enterprise, and, and the ship came to be known as the galloping ghost of the Oahu coast because it had been claimed to be sunk so many times. But eventually, Benny, his marriage was suffering. He hadn't seen his child in so long. He wanted to go back to Washington right at the same time that Bill received a waiver for his uh, vision issues and was sent to the Pacific. So he and Benny basically traded places. And Bill was uh, joined the Central Pacific Campaign, the Island Hopping Campaign. He was Admiral Turner's flag secretary. He was in every engagement, Saipan, Iwo Jima, Okinawa, and then on to Manila for the final planning for the assault on mainland Japan. They're a real... real glutton for punishment <laughs> yes exactly <laughs> so what was what what's the role of a, a, a flag fla, uh, is it flag secretary uh well he had um he was personnel officer and flag secretary and his flag secretary basically he was the mouthpiece of the admiral uh, admiral turner where um they were doing of course this astoundingly complicated invasion 
planning of these islands, you know, an incomprehensible several thousand mile long supply chain. You needed every every manner of ship. You needed hospital ships. You needed battleships. You needed uh, Amtraks. You needed carriers and so forth, all of them with different fueling protocols. You needed food and medical supplies. You needed, you know, body bags. You needed morphine. You needed medics. And this was all Admiral Turner's responsibility to plan and coordinate among the multiple services. And Bill's job was basically to take Admiral Turner's orders and be the interface with these variety of of services to coordinate this planning. It was all in Admiral Turner's head. He may have been a hard-drinking individual, but he was brilliant. He was respected for his ability to create an invasion plan and prevail. Yeah, and they made hundreds of these uh, assault assault landings. And it it, it doesn't surprise me that... um, well, in the end, uh, Bill uh, collapses, doesn't he, through well, just intense work and, and uh... yes, he had he had um, several perforated stomach ulcers. He collapsed right after Saipan was declared secure, and he uh, was sent to Aia Heights Military Hospital at Oahu to recover. And Admiral Turner, and and, and of course, he thought, oh you know, that this was it for him. But Admiral Turner said uh, he arranged for him to be medevaced and said, by the time the ships, the the, um, the fleet returns to Pearl Harbor, get yourself well, your job as flag secretary is permanent. And he did get himself healed and was ready for the, the um, to participate in the invasion planning and the actual invasion of Iwo Jima, which was the next invasion. Yeah, and, and then, you know, uh- and I think is it Turner's withdrawn. Is it after Iwo Jima Turner is withdrawn? Then they both go to start planning the uh, attack on Japan itself. It was at Okinawa. At Okinawa. Okinawa. Oh yeah. Yes. Okay, yeah. Yeah. That, which was the other uh, yeah horrendous one. Nobody is uh, has any cushy number in in your family, do they? <laughs> no, I don't say. I, I don't think anybody got off easily. Now there was there was a sister. I don't really talk about it that much in the book. A sister, Rosemary, and she was an aide to the commandant of the Brooklyn Navy Yard. So she stayed stateside. Of course, women weren't sent to the front in World War II. And, uh, but all four were officers in the Naval Service, um, which brings us to Helen, their mother. And she was, uh, you know, for, let's see, she graduated from college in 1904, I believe. One of four or five percent of American women to go to college she went to Wellesley. She was extremely well educated. She was assertive. She was. She did not comply with the gender roles of the time. She was not the warm mother rocking on front porch waiting for her sons to come home. She wrote the secretaries of the army and the navy, and she wrote Roosevelt and a number of others, and they wrote her back. She kept diaries, which I uncovered uh, along the way, and I actually had a pretty good working draft at that point. When I came across those diaries, I I knew I had to start over and thread in her voice. She is prescient and canny in her observations of the war. And she's also a very sympathetic figure as revealed through her personal observations and, you know, just basically opening her heart to her diary. She really wasn't shy about writing to somebody if she felt there was uh, something to be said. So, you know, when she writes to Roosevelt, (laughs) <laughs> I mean, he writes back. Um, incredibly, he he didn't have to. He could have had someone else do it for him. But he, you know, she gets a reply. I think it, it, I've often wondered. He couldn't have written every angst-ridden mother. I have to believe it was because he and Bill were very close. And that, you know, he knew about Barton's plight because he had spent this time with Bill in the map room and felt, you know, that it was the right thing to do to reply personally. It was harder for him to reply once he knew, you know, once these escapees had come back with their stories, and of course it was sent directly to Roosevelt once they were debriefed, it was harder for him to maintain an artifice of, don't worry, we're doing the best we can, because he knew how bad it was, you know, even in advance of the story actually being released to the public. I guess the other guy, the other, the other, other pair, at least she knows what's happening to them. So there's less to worry about. It's the, it's the fear of the unknown with, when it comes to the uh, Barton as the, as the prisoner of war. Yes. And she, she worried 
more than it seemed that the officials worried about the converging of fleets and services, the Army and the Navy in the Philippine Sea. She worried about this. She she confided to her diary that she was afraid these prisoners were going to get caught in the crossfire because of lack of coordination between services. I mean, this was remarkable that she had these observations. Um, Which indeed is, is what was happening as the Japanese tried to remove prisoners back to the mainland. Exactly right. Um, incidents of friendly fire, incidents of um, mistaken targets, all kinds of incidents uh, of that nature. Because MacArthur had been named the supreme commander, you know, of the Pacific, of the Philippine, Philippine campaign, if you will, uh, finally at that point, the two fleets, the fifth fleet and the seventh fleet, didn't have so much as a common radio channel. MacArthur said, you have to communicate your messages to me first, and then we will rebroadcast them to other members of the fleet. And of course, this was a travesty. Uh, certainly not a way to run a war. When you look at what, um, when the Navy was at Saipan and they found out that the fleet was coming to prevent the Navy and the Marines from taking Saipan, the minute by moment by moment instructions, you know, sending part of the fleet to meet the Japanese, maintaining vigilance off the island of Saipan at the same time, all of that in a unified command was made possible. But in a divided command, which was the problem in the Philippines as the armies and the navies approached to retake the islands, um, it was a divided command between the navy and the army. But since they were in MacArthur's theater, he had final say. There was a basically a dividing, a lad, jealously guarded latitude and longitudes of who what, had theater primacy depending on where you were physically located. And of course... MacArthur was located in Australia and he had theater primacy in that part of the world. How, how much actually could the boys when they were in in, in the Pacific theater, uh, how, you know, how much could they actually do to physically try and attempt to track down the whereabouts of, uh, of Barton? You mean when Bill finally got to Manila and started looking for him or well yeah well but they, but they both sort of put feelers out at some point but I guess you know, Bill's going to be there as you said, when they get back to Manila. <laughs> I think that the intelligence was relatively poor. There were all kinds of sightings of when the planes were going in to basically soften up the target, if you will, the carrier planes were going in and they, they saw these prisoners. They saw the, they saw the camps. They flew over Cabanatuan in a th thrilling moment when the prisoners saw for the first time that these were Navy planes and they, oh. they waggled their wings and they, buzzed the, the guards in the in the nests that were at each corner of the camp. So they knew they were there and they knew where they were, but they did not come in and and rescue them. And and this went on for months where they were sort of going in and around and in and around because the plan was to begin at Leyte and do a slog up the islands. They they bypassed Mindanao, and and prisoners were caught in the crossfire. They were absolutely caught in the crossfire. Yeah, it must have been frightfully thrilling morale boost for them when they're you know half starved to see these planes, and then identifying them as American planes. I mean, what a what a morale boost after all these years of of absolute nightmare for them. Yes, but it was it it was a thrill, uh, you know. That morale kind of rose and plummeted, rose and plummeted. They would see these sightings. It was the Battle of Manila. They were at Bilibid Prison in Manila, and they would thrill at the sight of these dogfights through the bars of their prison. And then a typhoon would roar over Manila, and the planes did not return. And then they were just left to speculate: what now? What now? Just when our hopes were at their highest possible level the Japanese kept saying we're going to ship you out we're going to ship you out and really what was happening is that MacArthur uh, got bogged down at Leyte he said I'm going to take all, the, all of the islands in four to six weeks and you know with this many troops and so on and so forth and this was really his first full-scale interaction with the with the nature of of warrior that that he was up again i mean the japanese were trained and hardened fighters the slog up the island chain to manila was much more difficult and much more costly in blood and treasure than macarthur ever ever anticipated
Mm, indeed. Yeah, which, which then allows then the Japanese, as we you know, touched upon, to start um, evacuating prisoners. I mean, what were conditions like on these uh, on these uh, prison ships to the Japanese mainland? They were mostly merchant ships, which which no one to this day understands why they were not marked as carrying prisoners of war. But they also carried uh, Japanese troops and personnel. They carried uh, war materiel and supplies, uh, and that cargo, if you will, was was um, quartered were quartered in the upper decks and the. Prisoners were kept in the holds in the very bottom of the decks. They, there was no air. There was no water. There was no food. Hundreds suffocated to death. They were sort of coated in fecal filth. I mean, it was Dante's Inferno. And, and it was repeated over and over and over again as they were shipping them out from various uh, points of departure in convoy. And, of course, lying in wait uh, were these roving submarine bands who had code breakers. They knew where the ships were leaving from. They knew what their destination was. So there were the submarines that were lying in wait for these convoys and also uh, the carrier planes were out in force. Look, and their orders were destroy all exiting shipping, all exiting Japanese shipping. They were dodging their own Navy, you know, as they made passage from the Philippines and other places too. There were several British prisoners of war, of course, that were caught in this same crossfire. You've read the book, so you remember the section where they, I think they had been working on the Burma Road, and they were kept in the hull of the, the one of these ships in Manila Harbor for six weeks. Six weeks. It's almost unimaginable. It's hard not to read those chapters without uh, a tear in your eye. I mean, it's Dante's Inferno is a very descri- very good description. It's uh, horrendous, absolutely horrendous. So many of them lost their minds in the in the middle of the night. They would somehow get a hold of a sharp object and slash somebody's arm to drink their blood. They drank their own urine. They went they went crazy. See, they lost their minds. Yeah, as I say, I I, I yeah struggled through that. But at the close of the war. Uh, Bills with Admiral Turner planning the invasion of Japan. He's more than aware of of uh, how difficult that was going to be and the enormity of the task. Um, I, I wonder. I wonder what um, the brothers' reaction was to the dropping of the atomic bomb. Oh, I think that it was almost universal among the services, uh, and I would say also uh, among the civilian population that anything that brought this war to an end at the earliest possible date was worth it. I think they were thrilled. I think they were relieved. I think anybody who was being redeployed from the European front was relieved. I think it was a very positive reaction. Yeah, it's, fu- it's funny how, uh, you know, all these decades later, people put a slightly different uh, slant on it, but uh, on the dropping of the bomb, but it's hard not to speak to the people at the time who were just... <laughs> Just so very, very leave, relieved that, that that it was over. Yes, I agree with you. But, but what I think is not well understood, and which I make a point of detailing, is that many more Japanese would have died had we invaded the home islands. It would have been a, a two-part invasion. One assault on Honshu, would, that would be the later assault, and, and the outer islands first and they were planning a water's edge defense they had recruited all the school children they had hundreds and hundreds of suicide planes hidden all over the home islands they were of such balsa light construction that uh, they could not be detected by ship born uh, radar which had been so helpful uh, at Okinawa and uh, and Iwo Jima and also the Philippine Sea Um, which is when the kamikaze offense had had become a primary Japanese weapon. And so this would have spelled casualties for the Allied navies. I think by that point they were converging, onward up to a million losses, as had been the case at every single previous island assault, the Japanese casualties were much, much higher because even when the island was considered secure, they would they preferred suicide or a bonsai charge to being captured or surrendered. This was a major cultural chasm between the Japanese 
and the Americans. From the youngest age, every Japanese boy was taught the Bushido Code. And according to Bushido Code, a Japanese warrior does not surrender. They, they kill themselves. And this is why one of the primary reasons they were not convention signatories of the Geneva 1929 conventions, because the, those conventions required uh, that when someone surrendered, when a soldier surrendered, that their next of kin be notified. And they don't, Japanese do not condone surrender among their troops, and they wouldn't sign the convention as a result. And that, and, and 41% of prisoners of the Japanese died in World War II versus 2% of prisoners of the Nazis that died, American uh, allied prisoners of the Nazis that, that died. I mean, that was, that was just evidence of their disdain for if you, if you were a surrendered prisoner or you allowed yourself to be captured, you deserved the worst possible treatment. How did the brothers feel about the Japanese? You know, how did your father feel about the Japanese post-war? Well, I can tell you, they never drove a Japanese car. N neither did my father. He always refused to. Right. And nor, <laughs> nor did we, I might add. Um, but I would say that he got on with his life. Um, my mother, of course, w was an analyst with the Manhattan Project. Uh, she w worked at MIT. They met after the war. You know, I would say that they were pretty unified in their um, – they'd lost – many, 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 many friends, both of them. And it was hard for them to, it's so politically incorrect in the year 2017 to be saying these things. I recognize that. But if you put yourself in the place of having lost half your high school class, which was the case of my mother, you know, so many of uh, his Navy colleagues, the case of my father and Benny as well, I wouldn't say that they it ruined the rest of their lives, as it did for many. I mean, I would say many prisoners of war went on and and um, they could not get past their anger. There was no apology. There were no reparations for forced slave labor and for other crimes against humanity, and they died. I think the real dividing line between those that were able to get on with their lives and those that could not was, one, an individual's capacity for forgiveness. And while we didn't drive, you know, Japanese cars and my parents had a certain approach to how they talked about the war, I wouldn't say that they continued to gnash their teeth. Yeah, I think that's probably similar. You know, my father never left Northwest Europe, but he had friends who'd been in uh, the Pacific and he was very, you know, very, very similar, refused to drive a Japanese car. Wouldn't necessarily, he, you know, he was, yeah, as you say, not gnashing his teeth against them, but there was a sort of um, a certain a sadness, I suspect, in the fact that they, they even all that time later, all this time later, that they, they never admitted to it. And certainly, it's funny of his friends, the ones that didn't talk about the war were the tended to be the Pacific. The Northwest Europe boys, I think, were all, were all very much more, uh, it's a very, very different very different war for them. But, you know, I, the Navy was not only my father's professional life. Of course, he went on. He became an admiral. He was the judge advocate general. It was also my parents' social life. I mean, we were. this was a total Navy immersion family. We would hear them talk about it. And when they talked about it, they mostly talked about kind of the intelligence they had at this point versus had they had it later or earlier. And they talked about battles and they talked about people that they missed, that they lost. But I don't ever remember those conversations being angry. They were sort of mournful and solemn and somber. I think they were committed to not forgetting. Mm. Well, that, that, that seems like a, a good place to end. Thank you. Sally's book, The Jersey Brothers, A Missing Naval Officer in the Pacific and His Family's Quest to Bring Him Home is available now. Not only is the story of the three brothers a fantastic read, but Sally has done a grand job of interweaving it with what was going on in the wider Pacific War. I have a link on the website. If you've not visited it recently, I've added a bookstore uh, page to make it easier to find authors we've talked to or books we've talked about. There is even a page with books recommended by listeners like you. If you have a book you think should be 
obligatory World War II reading, shoot me an email or send me a message on Facebook and I'll add it to the page. Next time out we'll be looking at a British Tommy who fought his way off the beaches of Dunkirk, through the Middle East, Sicily, then landed back in Europe just after D-Day. I'm looking forward to this one, I've been trying to record it since Christmas but my family keep borrowing the memoir. So for now, I'm Angus Wallace and thanks for listening.